Ben Yannick, il m'a dit de faire les deux. Fait que je lui ai dit de faire mon anglais. C'est long. Non, non. C'est bon? C'est Nick Tarn. Ok, c'est bon. Ok. Euh, bon. Bon, bonsoir tout le monde, euh, on, va, on va commencer. <rire> ok, mais ben, euh, on, 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 on commence parce que là, il y a quand même des gens qui sont sur YouTube qui nous, qui nous écoutent. Euh, ben, bon, bonsoir tout le monde, euh, merci beaucoup. Pour... Bonsoir. Oui, bonsoir. Désolé tout le monde. <rire> Ok, oui, merci tout le monde de, 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 d'être venu euh, avec nous. Euh, je suis comme, euh, un peu comme, euh, excité, euh, fatigué, tout ça en même temps, hein, parce que je ne savais pas qu'il va y avoir autant de monde. Fait que je ne me suis pas préparé, mais bon, euh, mais que s'il y a quelque chose qui ne qui, qui marche pas bien. Euh, ben, je vais commencer tout de suite par la chose la plus importante, c'est que D'habitude, euh, mon, euh, mon ami Yannick, il me dit toujours ça, mais je ne comprends pas trop pourquoi il dit toujours ça. C'est qu'à Montréal Python, on a le code de, de conduit. C'est que, là, là, je comprends parce que là, on est comme beaucoup de monde. Fait que, on veut que tout le monde euh, s'amuse, mais en respectant les choses, euh, les, ben, les autres. Fait que, c'est ça un peu le code de conduit de, de Montréal Python. Fait que, euh, si vous avez quelque chose que vous n'êtes pas content ou quelqu'un qui est comme un peu trop méchant, mais vous pouvez me parler. Um, et uh, so uh, t- thank you everyone who um, to to uh, joining us. Uh, I'm uh, really excited and uh, I, I don't know what, what to say, but uh, I would like to uh, just say that uh, at um, uh, Moran Python we have uh, the code of conduct. So we want everybody to be uh, to have fun, but uh, respect uh, each other. So if you see something that is not right, uh, you can talk to me or to Israel or Alex. Uh, okay, but je vais arrêter de parler parce que je sais plus quoi dire. Bah, je vais juste uh, introduire tout de suite uh, Alex qui va qui va parler un peu de Flair. Oui. C'est bon. Okay. Merci. Alors, bienvenue chez Flair. Vous êtes dans les bureaux de Flair Systems de Montréal. Euh, Flair, c'est une entreprise en cybersécurité. On fait un, un SaaS euh, en ligne qui permet aux équipes de cybersécurité d'avoir une vue sur ce qu'on appelle le, leur digital footprint. Puis, le digital footprint, ça veut dire plusieurs choses. Ça veut dire euh, les services que vous avez d'exposer sur Internet. Ça veut dire ton équipe de marketing qui supporte un terrain public. Ça veut dire euh, tes consultants qui commettent du code publiquement sur GitHub avec ton IP. Puis, euh, ce qu'on, ce qu'on, puis ce qui se passe sur le dark web, ce que les gens euh, disent de toi, euh, disent sur toi, puis les mots de passe que tes employés se sont fait voler. Nous, on, on aide les entreprises à avoir une vue sur ces choses-là et à réagir euh, rapidement lorsqu'il y a des problèmes. C'est euh, le dernier meet-up qu'on a, qu'on a organisé, c'était Postgres Montréal. Il y avait à peu près 20 personnes qui avaient dit qu'elle allait venir, puis euh, on a commandé la pizza pour 20 personnes. Euh, il y avait à peu près 4 personnes qui se sont présentées. Alors aujourd'hui, on s'est dit, on va laisser faire pour la pizza. On s'est définitivement trompé. Fait que si c'est un pattern qui se répète, on va définitivement s'ajuster pour le futur. Alors, euh, mais merci d'être venu. On est bien content de vous voir en si grand nombre. Uh, to quickly repeat in English, uh, Flare Systems is a is a SaaS company. We, we provide a, a SaaS for cybersecurity teams. And what we do is we help them understand the, the, what we call their digital footprint. So this can be a number of things. So this can be uh, your open services that are available from the web. This can be your marketing team that opened the public Trello and uh, didn't realize it. Or this can be uh, consultants publishing uh, your IP on GitHub by mistakes. Uh, and what we, or even, um, People, uh, people stealing your private information and posting it on the dark web. So what we do is we help cybersecurity teams uh, be alerted as soon as these things happen and react uh, ideally proactively about these things. 
Uh, as I was saying before, it's the, the last time that we hosted a meetup, we had, uh, it was Postgres Montreal. We, we had about 20 people that said they would come. Uh, it ended up being about four and we had ordered pizza for 20. So we ate pizza the whole week. We tried to avoid the mistake uh, this week because, uh, you know, 50 is a larger number and we don't want to eat pizza for two weeks. Um, but uh, we're going to adapt next time if, uh, if, it's, if it's a trend that keeps, uh, keeps the same. So uh, welcome, welcome at Flare. And uh, so we, we are always looking for new talent. So if you, if you think what we're doing is interesting, uh, please uh, either talk to me, Israel, Mathieu that's hiding in the back, or anybody with a Flare shirt, and we'll be happy to, uh, to talk to you about what we're doing. So without further ado, I'll, uh, I'll uh, leave it to Israel, which is a co-founder at Flare. Thank you, Alex. Um, I'm just going to show my slides. Um, so, uh, anyway. Technical problem. Okay, so thank you for, for being here, first of all. Uh, very exciting to see this many people. Uh, so my, my presentation today is about moving to Python 3.11 um, and like why and how we should be doing it. Uh, so first of all, like who, who am I? Uh, as Alex said, uh, I'm Israel Ali. Uh, you can, well, my email uh, here and my MDL is really on GitHub or whatever is Israel 17. Uh, I am co-founder and chief architect at Flare. Uh, so I've been working here since the very beginning. Um, so it's like so small, I can see my slides. So yeah, so I, I won't repeat what Alex said, but like Flare is a cybersecurity SaaS product. So how we call that? We are hiring. So if you are excited about what we do, please talk to us. Uh, I'm also I'm into cyber security. Uh, I've been a reverse engineer in the past, uh, doing sustainability research, uh, founding uh, C my uh, binaries, uh, things like that. Uh, I do a lot of Python uh, in the past for my exploit. Nowadays, just to build a product, so we like this sound coming out of this computer. Uh, Dirk, how can you mute? Oh, I'll just close it, I guess. Yeah. I got it. Um, so yeah, I do a lot of Python. I so love Rust, uh, just like language theory, I think it's pretty neat. Uh, and I'm a climber, so I do a lot of climbing. You might see a few pictures of climbing. Uh, yeah, Python and climbing, I, I can talk about hours. Uh, so going back to the talk, uh, why bother about Python 3.11? Uh, in my opinion, it's uh, cheaper and easier to move to Python 11, uh, 3.11 as soon as possible. Uh, but not too soon. So, like, I, I know, like, Python 3.11 has been out for, I know, like, five or six months already. Uh, I'm usually of the opinion of, like, moving to the next Python version right away is a bit risky. Like, dependencies won't update right away, so there might be breakage that you can fix without forking the dependencies. Uh, also, bugs and all. So, why now? Well, it's been uh, enough months that most dependencies has moved to Python 3.11. Uh, all the bugs has been not all, but like many of them has been fixed. Right now it's like uh, three eleven dot three. Uh, so many bug fixes has been coming in. Uh, so why should you move now to Python three eleven? Is that whatever Python you use, it won't be maintained forever. So like if you are using Python three dot seven, uh, eventually it won't be uh, like there won't be any security update for it. So you should be moving eventually to Python three whatever the new release is. Um, also, your dependencies are, are moving too. So if you use dependencies in your project, you can, uh, there's a point where these dependencies won't support older Python versions. So if you stick to your old Python version, you just 
going to have an issue with your dependencies as well and the security uh, impact from it as well. And it's just so much easier to move from Python 3.10 to 3.11 than doing 3.10 to 3.16. Uh, or like people are still on Python 2.7, like migrating to Python 3.11 is going to be a lot of headache. So just do it every time and you're going to save yourself uh, a lot of pain. Also, like new toys are exciting. Like people uh, love to buy a new iPhone or new Android phone every year. They're going to pay thousands of bucks. And now we have like a new Python for free every year. Like just do it. Like you have a bunch of new features. You have exciting syntax, a typing extension, uh, and it's just free. So yeah. And also it's better. Like I'm going to go through it, but like Python 3.11 is much faster than the older Python. Uh, and you don't have to change anything to get that. Um, so going through the, the, the famous toys, like why I'm excited about Python 3.11. Uh, first of all, there's like the, the new exceptional toys. So it's a bit uh, word and play. Uh, so they implement the first step, uh, which is fine grain error allocation and traceback. So what it does is that now when you have a traceback, like the, you know, you have an error this, in this file at this line number. Uh, now you have like the small squiggly line and it tells you exactly where uh, on the line there's a, an issue. And I can actually prepare um, a few interactive demo of these new features. There you go. Is it big enough? Uh, that's really yeah. late I can't see on my screen. Uh, actually, so I'm, I might just uh, quickly add that. Um, so yeah, here is an. Right. Uh, so here is an example of like a common code pattern you might see. So we have like this dictionary, uh, like inside the dictionary you have sub dictionary. Check it out. At one point you just like access, uh, access uh, some keys inside the directory, inside your dictionary. Sorry. Uh, I just found out that the mic was like facing away from me, so sorry, people online. Um, so if I run this snippet of code, um, I see I have like a, an error. So like non-type object not subscribable. So I have a non-type somewhere in my dictionary. But if I look at the traceback, I don't have a clue of like, is it repository? Is that owner? Is that info? Is that email? I have no idea at all. So what happens if I use uh, Python 311? Now I have the famous squiggly line. Uh, so I can see like my non uh, my non value is being used uh, well info is being called sorry info item is being called on the non value so I can I know that the non value is owner and if I look at the original code yes it is owner uh, so that's why I think like these new features are very great they can save you a lot of time especially when you look at, at the log uh, in production it necessarily can repro the bug right away and now we can look at the log at the traceback and know okay I have like Clearly, this value can be learned. So now I can just fix it by using a get access or something like that. Uh, and there's also this other use case I think is great is when you have, uh, let's say, this code. So, like uh, this tree function, what it does pretty, pretty much is that I have like this dictionary of vector data and I just dot product this vector. But what can happen like, if my dictionary is not built the way I thought, I will have an error. So, let's say, like, I'm just going to run this code. Uh, so like right now it works, so it tell me like my uh, dot product of these two vectors is four. But what will happen if like I remove uh, one key value in there? Uh, so I run the same code, now I have a, a key error, but like I have so much information in the stack trace that doesn't help me. Like I know there's a key error in, in Y, so I have either data one or data zero that might be missing. And if I look at the stack trace, like it's either the vector A or vector B that might have the Y missing, so I have like four possibility that I need to investigate to know the error. Uh, however, if I use Python 3.11, uh, now I have this squiggly line. So I know exactly like it's my uh, data one that is missing the Y. And then I know it's my uh, second vector that has the data missing the Y. So like just looking at the backtrace, I can know right away uh, where, where in my dictionary or my data structure I'm missing the, the data. Um, so yeah, and there's another bunch of uh, error that it can really tell you, like if you have a bunch of uh, division and like one is being divided by zero, it's going to tell you like it's this variable at this zero. Uh, so just looking at the backtrace, you can fix a lot of bug. Uh, you don't, you won't be, you won't need to like reproduce everything locally to uh, to be able to find exactly where it is. 
So I think that's pretty great. So that alone is worth to move to Python uh, to again. Uh, but that's not all. There's also a new feature in the exception that you can add note. Uh, so that's pretty useful if you want to add context to exception uh, without necessarily like wrapping it in a new exception. Uh, so now there's like this add note function. You just give a string so you can like add the description of the error. Uh, it's pretty useful to, um, to for exception group, which I'm going to come with some other features. Uh, and just like a small note, like the notes are stored in a new magic attribute called underscore underscore notes. So you can access them in your code for whatever reason. Uh, and if we look at how it look, um, uh, so here I have a small use case where it could be like a, 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 a use case for this note, add note thing. Uh, so I have like this test runner uh, that like takes a bunch of value and I run tests on them. Uh, so my test is pretty much just assert the value. I keep it simple. Uh, and then I have this run test function that it get the value and like execute the unit test. Uh, so that could be like PyTest uh, like framework, right? Uh, and then when I have a test that fail, I catch the exception. And what I want to do is I want to, to be able to, like, to, to add context there. So I want to tell like what is a value that pretty much uh, raise the exception. Uh, so what I will do with Python 3.10 or before is that I will create this new test error that takes in a new like context. So uh, I create, a, I just raise a new test error with a message that test, yeah, the test failed with this specific uh, value. And then I can always uh, like attach the other exception as the cause. I can raise from the other exception. Uh, so if I do that, uh, it's still pretty great. Like uh, before I could get a lot of value out of it. So I can see like, oh yeah, my test failed because of the false value. Uh, and then I can see the original error at the top. Uh, it's great, but it's not perfect because then I like I don't have an assertion error anymore. So if I have, uh, like I'm changing the error type. So if I have, if I'm building an API that won't like to call under API, I'm kind of uh, hiding this error with my own error, which is a bit annoying. Like if uh, another, API will want to cache the assertion error. It will need to cache first my test error, then get the cause exception, and then check if the type is exactly assertion error or something else. So not the best. Uh, what you can do now with Python 3.11 is that there's the add note thing. And so now I can like do, like before I run my test, there's an exception. Instead of creating a new exception, I just add a, a note to this exception, uh, which like uh, as before, like test fail with this specific test case. And then I can raise my exception. Actually, here I should remove the, the exception. So I can just re-raise the exception. And if I run, if I run this code, uh, now it's much nicer because I have a single exception, which is still the original exception, so assertion error. But I still have my little message down there that tell me like, yeah, like the exception failed because of this test case. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's gonna be pretty useful for the test framework for, um, like I know hypothesis is like the, the fuzzing framework that just find a lot of value. Uh, so instead of like stopping at the first error, you can just attach a node to the error and then raise it to you and you can like have more information right away. Um, so yeah, that's another nice uh, feature of exception added with Python 3.11. Uh, and finally, there's the exception group. This is a, like a syntax, uh, a new syntax feature in Python uh, it's actually very nice for parallel codes. So like when you run many function in parallel and some of them might fail, uh, before there were like two ways to deal with the error is that either you fail on the first exception, so you don't care about the other, you get the first one, you raise it, uh, deal with it, but then you lose track of all the other tasks that might fail as well. Uh, otherwise you just like have this function that return a list of results, maybe the result is an error. So then you have like a list of errors, but it works, but you cannot use the except syntax where you can like do tie except and then catch a specific kind of error, do this code. Now you have a list, we can like iterate the list, do is instance, uh, my error is this kind of error. So it's not as handy as uh, just like the tie except syntax. So accession group are a way to help with that. Um, so the way it works, Um, now you can accept with a, a star after the accept. Um, so in that case, I have like a, a, a task group that can create many tasks. And I'm gonna talk about that later. Task group is a new Python 3.11 features. And what it does pretty much is like, it allows me to run many tasks in parallel. And when I get out of the context, it's gonna wait for all the tasks to complete. 
However, if the task fund raise an exception, it's going to raise uh, all the exception as a single group. Uh, so here I have the accept star, which means like if you throw, if you raise an exception group, I want to catch the values of this type. Uh, so even though here I will have like two errors, right? I have a value error division divided by zero and the index key error. Uh, so I can tell the my Python code that out of all these exceptions are being raised, I want to have the value error. In, I want to handle the value error in there. The nice thing is that I could have like two of them, right? I could have value error as well here. Um, and that way my exception group will have both exceptions. So if I run this code, we can see how it looks. So I have a catch value error. So here we, we see like my code, sorry. Okay. So my code, like I, I cache the value error, I print it, uh, and then I print like cache value error, and then I list all the exception that was part of it. Uh, somehow I only have one, so I'm not sure what happened. Oh, I returned the um, demo god. There we go. So now I should have two of them. Uh, yeah. So now I catch my exception group of type value error, and I. I will only have the value error uh, exception. So, but I have three of them. So there's still like the other one is the, the key error uh, that I didn't catch. So it's still gonna like, I'm gonna go through my except. And once I'm, I go through all of them, then it's like the default Python exception behavior. So if I don't handle an exception, it's gonna like keep going uh, in my stack frame and I don't have any handlers. So just end up in the default uh, async IO handler, which is gonna tell me, uh, you have like one exception group, it's still an exception group, uh, but it have only one exception, even though initially it, it had three of them. Uh, since I handled two of them, there's only one left. Uh, so that's pretty neat for that. Like before I would have to do like a async IO gather, and then I will have a list of error back from it. Uh, and just dealing with the list of the session, not as nice as doing like the try accept. And I could even like do the accept uh, key, error, catch key error. And now I want to have an unhandled exception. So, so yeah, so that's pretty neat in my opinion, uh, especially if you deal with like code, like any pattern where you do many things in parallel and some of them might fail, some of them might not. Uh, so I'm thinking about like even uh, unit tests actually, if we go back to a, uh, to, to this one. So going back to like our previous example of like the, this test runner. So I want to run all my tests and I don't want to, to stop at the first failure, right? The first exception I see, like I don't want to crash everything. So I want to just like collect all these exceptions and then I want to create a new exception group, raise it, so like the whatever call my, my test runner, I can deal with the exception itself. Uh, so like taking the same code as I showed before that run the test, now I have this small extra thing in there. So I try to run my test. If there's an exception, I just add it to my list. And at the end of my run all the test function, I, I'm just going to raise, actually like, it's missing an if uh, exception, but I want to raise if there's none. Uh, but if there's any exception, I want to raise an exception group. And it's very simple. Like just raise a group. You have a classic exception, you put a message first, and then you can put a list of the exception is going to be included in this group. Uh, so I run my run test function, I could do like try accept star and then put some type around it. Um, so yeah, so this code, this code works. If I try that, we see here like the, the same code as before, they will like fail at the first uh, test failing. Now I can see like all my fail, uh, all my failed tests. Like I have three of them, the one at false, the other none, and then the empty list. Um, so yeah. So that was pretty much it for the exception. I think that's a, a lot of like new feature for AR and Ling, which is like, as a software engineer, dealing with AR is like day to day, uh, sadly, but uh, sometimes we can't avoid the, the thing failing. Uh, but moving forward, the, the next change I want to talk about is about async IO. So um, a, as I showed before, this, this new task group helper. So it's pretty much the same as doing like a create task repeatedly. Uh, and at the end of the day, just do a gather, async IO that gather. Uh, so gather, what it does, like you give it a list of tasks and then it will return uh, either uh, when the first phase or all of the tasks complete. Uh, so the task group is nice because it's like uh, with the context that I showed before. Um, 
as I showed before, like you here, I'm sure like with the, because it's a context, uh, like whatever I do, I can return in the middle of it and it's still gonna wait for the task to complete. Uh, so pretty neat in my opinion. There's also a bunch of small helper like this uh, async IO timeout. Uh, so now we can start the context, give it a timeout, and then we can await task inside of it. And when a timeout hit, it's going to cancel whatever task is still running. It's going to raise a timeout exception. Uh, so there's a way to do it before, but there will be much more lines of code than like just async with as a async IO timeout. Uh, oops. There's also async IO barrier. So barrier is a new synchronization primitive, a bit like semaphore. Actually, it's like pretty much the exact opposite of a semaphore. Uh, so semaphore is like a more complex mutex, uh, but like a barrier is pretty much uh, like you give it a number of time you need to wait. And then you can have a bunch of tasks that are gonna wait for it and it's gonna block until there's like n number of tasks that wait for it. So in this example, I create a barrier with for three items. I start two tasks in the background that's going to wait for it, and these tasks are going to block because there's, still, there's only like two wait being called. Uh, then I sleep for 10 seconds, and then after the, the third wait, I have my own, like my main task that wait for it, and it's going to unlock the barrier. So all the tasks are going to keep running after one. Uh, so it's pretty useful if you have like, I don't know, some uh, initialization routine that has to wait like, for everyone to be initialized before keep moving uh, or thing about it. Um, however, like typing changed a lot of my types. So like I I use extensively my Python all typing feature that comes in Python since like a, I don't know, like the four last release. Um, so like Python 11 version that has done on that. Uh, first of all, there are the variadic generics. Uh, so they are very useful to like put the generic on the shape of the type you want. So like when we say shape, it's a bit like a when you have a tuple, uh, like a tuple of int, it's not the same as a tuple of int int. Uh, like both on, uh, don't have the same dimension and the same type for each dimension. Uh, for people using NumPy, it's pretty much like a, NumPy can have the array of many dimensions. Uh, so like the, the number of dimension and the type of this dimension are kind of the shape. Uh, so with this new feature, people, uh, like library developer would be able to to make a function that takes only like two array of the same shape. So I won't be able to add, uh, at least my pi will scream at me if I try to add uh, an array of int with an array of string, or an array of int int with an array of int int int. Like these are not the same shape. I can't multiply them, I can add them. Uh, so it will allow to do the generic function to do that. Uh, it's really also useful for callable. Uh, callable. Uh, so like the callable, you can give like the, the first parameter of callable is the args that you can give to it. However, there's no way to like, uh, I want to give it uh, like a tuple, a generic tuple argument. And it's a bit hard to explain with my word, uh, but I'm going to show you an example anyway. Uh, however, like, this is a small caveat. Uh, my pi, like I, I tested today and my pi is still very unstable. Uh, my test actually made my pi crash. Uh, and the, like uh, the new star thinks that is not working. So I'm gonna show you what I mean by that. Uh, so I have like this, uh, first example is from the Python documentation from the, from the PEP. Uh, so this uh, actually like this uh, standard module, the process where you can create a process with a target, it is a, a function. And then you can pass like the argument that's gonna be passed to the target. So right now my pipe is no way to tell I want my argument to be the same as the args of the callable give me without doing like an advanced uh, class or something like that. However, now you can do, first of all, a type bar tuple. So it's kind of like a type bar, like many type bar, like an array of type bar, if you want. Uh, and then I can see, like, so my callable is going to get uh, one of these many uh, type bar, and my args is going to be the same as well. So it's going to take a tuple of these many type bar. So it allows me to have a signature that like, this process, if I, if I have this function take an int and a string, uh, if I try to create a process with this function and I give it an int and a string, it's going to work. But if I try to do the opposite, then my file can scream at me, like if I to pass a, a, a string while I expect the int, uh, so please don't do that. Um, so that's pretty useful, but unfortunately, if I try to run that in my PI, uh, the latest release in Python 3 run, I get like internal error, uh, backface, and nope. Israel? Oui? Il uh, y, y a un son statique qui a commencé il y a environ uh, 3-4 minutes sur ton micro. Est-ce qu'il y a une batterie qui pourrait être faible dessous uh, une mauvaise connexion? 
C'était super clair quand tu as commencé, puis ça a commencé euh, à faire un peu statique euh, il n'y a pas tellement longtemps. On, on, on a reçu le, le commentaire euh, sur YouTube, donc c'est pas juste moi. Là, je t'entends plus. Et maintenant, est-ce que ça marche? Ah, c'est très bon. Okay. Parle juste un petit peu plus pour vérifier qu'il n'y a pas de statique. Euh, allô, qu'est-ce que ça marche? Ah, bien? magnifique. Merci beaucoup. Parfait, c'est plaisir. Euh, où on est -je? Oui. Euh, fait que ça, c'est... Yeah, so that's the, the, the new feature. Um, and when I say like the, the store syntax, is that you can use the unpack... Oh, sorry. You can use the unpack uh, kind of meta type uh, to, to tell that like I want to like do a star, uh, but with the new syntax, you should be able to do that. Uh, so like just like you do with the star args to say like my args, I want like to unpack it. Uh, you, you will be able to do the same uh, for this type bar tuple. However, Python 11 add the support of the type bar tuple, but not the star syntax yet. So I expect it to be eventually working. Uh, in the future. Uh, another example, I guess, that fits more the, the NumPy example. So I have this use case where I have this array uh, that is generic on the, the shapes. My shape is a tuple var tuple, a type var tuple, sorry. Uh, and then I have this function that multiply two array of the same shape. So they are both the same type based on the, with the same shape. And it returns also an array of the same shape. So the nice thing with that is that I have this single function that could do like the, the whatever magic, like a For, for each uh, item in my, my array, I'm gonna like multiply them, return a new array with that. Uh, so if I have like this first array of shape uh, and I can use literals, I can see, I can tell my array is gonna be like 100 length. Uh, my second one is gonna be 4200 length. So I can't multiply them together anymore because they are not the same type. I can have this third array, so that's where like the, the type of tuples come in that you could not do before in Python without doing like a, one type for each possible Uh, count of dimension. So now I can tell my array has like two dimensions. So the first one is 100 length, uh, long. The second one is 42 long. And I can't multiply anything unless they have exactly the same type. So I can multiply 100 with 42. I can multiply 100 with 100 and 42. I'm going to have an error for each of them. Uh, and interestingly, this one works, I think, if I remember well. Yeah, so this one's going to yell at me. So if I look at the error, like line 21, 22, so the first one is working. Uh, the second one should be working as well. Sorry, my comment is wrong. Uh, but the other two one, like the, since they are not the same type, uh, it's not working. So it's, so my pie is working sometimes, not working the other time. Um, it's still very unstable. Uh, other thing is that like this, this, these things are more like small quality of life. So they are not like big new feature. You could do that before uh, with a bit of extra uh, code. Uh, so now we, you can mark like individual item in type dig as required or not required with like a, a new type marker. Uh, so it's a cleaner way to like mix uh, your dictionary with, uh, I, I need like this value absolutely, not this value. Uh, another caveat is that my pi don't really care about these other than for init. So if you try to access an optional value, it's going to be okay with it, even though it's like that you have no guarantee. Um, so an example of that is here. So that's pretty much what you will do before uh, Python 3.11. You will, if you want like to have a mix of optional and non-optional uh, key in your type dig, you have like first to have your required type dig. So I have my movie base uh, that uses the default type dig behavior. So all keys are required. Then I create this new class that inherits from the old one, but the, that says like my new attributes are going to be non-total, so optional. Uh, and here's how it works. I, I can create a movie with only a title because title is acquired, but I can't create a movie with only the year. It's going to tell me like argument missing for the title. However, with the new Python syntax, I can have a single class. So I have uh, this type dig class. And for my non-required, I can just mark them as not required. So like it works as before. If I do a title, it works. If I do only the year, it's going to tell me you, you need to pass a title, it's required. Uh, however, as I said, like now it's interesting because in my Vim ID, you can see like I have the actually type error. It tell me like uh, you cannot access uh, the item because you are not required. Uh, but that's using PyRide, not MyPy, that's why. So if I try with MyPy, 
Uh, it's gonna like give me the error for the first one, so title is missing, but it's not gonna give me any error for the clearly not working code at line 12. Uh, and last small improvement in typing, there's a self type. So like for, uh, like in the past you will need to do, sorry, uh, if I want to have like a, let's say a copy function, I need to like know the type of my class so I can like annote my function with this. So I will have a copy that return a parent. Maybe I have a child that will return like a copy, but return a child instead. So you can't like just copy paste the definition because it, it won't work the same. Uh, however, with the new Python version, you can now use the self type. So instead of saying like return a parent, I can just return self and it's gonna be inferred as being the parent. If I'm my child, it's gonna be inferred as being a child. So now I can just like, copy paste this uh, function definition, which is pretty great. Uh, and it also work for the, the class method. So uh, when I return a self, it's gonna return like the, the, the type of the function. Um, in fact, yeah, there's a, a, yet another one type improvement. Uh, there's now the official support for literal string type. I actually spoke about that in my last Montreal Python uh, presentation like uh, five months ago. Uh, so what it does is that, uh, so it allows you to have a type that only takes in literal strings. So like, uh, it's, not, it's not the same as a, a literal. Like literal allows you to say this value is literally only this literal. So it's, it's only one, it's only two. But you can say it's like any int or any string literal. Uh, so literal string will allow me to have like a, let's say execute function that's just gonna execute whatever code you pass it. And like clearly if you accept a variable, it's unsafe because you, you can't prove that you're gonna execute safe code. So I have this now this function that takes a, a literal string. So the only way I can call this function if I use uh, a string that is in the code. If I will try to, to read like user input and call my function with it, uh, then my pie will scream at me like uh, you try to pass a string where there's an expected literal string. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so as I said before, like some of these features are not working. Actually, the, the literal string, uh, I didn't test it, but. Like if I run this code, it's working, uh, but clearly it's not because I'm not passing a literal string in there. Uh, so the type are defined in my Py, but they are not checked. Uh, so that's this is a Python that track uh, the support of Python 3.11. Uh, so right now, like the variadic generic are not working as I showed before, like my Py just cache. And the literal, the literal string won't cache, but they won't give you an error if you try to pass a string where literal string is expected. So, so like the current implementation is just an alias and string. Um, and uh, like it's not a new feature, it's actually like a, a note. Uh, this, there was a pep about the feature annotation. So feature annotation is like a, a lazy evaluation of type annotation. So right now, when I define a class and I want to return my own type, I need to put it in string because this type, like if I, if I look at the class B, uh, B doesn't exist yet. So if I try to return like the first thing, the class A, it won't work on Python 3.10. It's gonna tell me like A doesn't exist because I'm still in the A definition. Uh, so with late uh, feature evaluation, I, it will allow the class A to work because the type annotation will be evaluated like at the end of the file or much later when A actually is defined. Uh, but that was supposed to be released in Python 3.10, then it postponed it to 3.11, and the 3.11 you say like, we won't be doing it right now. There's a bunch of like uh, issues that still have to be figured out. It's not as simple as just doing it. Uh, it might break some code and things like that. So eventually, maybe, we don't know. Um, so yeah, just a bunch of other names. I want to take too much time. I already take a lot. Um, we support now async uh, comprehension. So now we can do like a async for inside the comprehension. We didn't do that before. Uh, the 2ML lib is now a standard library. We don't need to install a, a new module to pip. Uh, actually, it's because of the, the, the Py project is a 2ML. So now like, uh, we can read them from a uh, built-in Python. Uh, a small, like something I actually used in the past, like the from ISO format and the date time, actually now support all the, most of the ISO 8601 formats. Before it will just support the one generated from Python. So if you, if like uh, you finish with the SZ, it will crash, it, will, it was expecting only like uh, the plus 00.00, .00 for time zone and like small thing like that. Uh, so that's a nice improvement. Uh, string enum, which is like a, it's like a minimum, but where each value can be used as a string as well. 
and it was an easy way to do it uh, with, in, on your own, but now it's like part of your SDD lib, it's pretty nice. Uh, for the one that has been playing a lot with regex, there's this, call, uh, this thing called catastrophic backtracking. So you can do like a, literally like four, uh, a four character regex that will take uh, pretty much hours to run on some input. So now you, there's a new SSF quantifier, so you can it, it pretty much avoid backtracking, like catastrophic backtracking. Uh, I have a link, you know, to explain it, but it's uh, a nice feature, trust me. Uh, and for typing, there's a, a certain universe. A certain universe, you can do a if, if, else, and like try to to restrict on the type. And at the end of your if, else, you can assert that you never reached this code uh, from my pipe. But there was a way to do it on your own before, but now it's part of the SD lib. But there's also a certain type that you can use. <clears throat> you can like assert type, uh, let's say, as type of X. I want to assert it's the type of the uh, int. And that now you can do and when Python run in runtime, just return X uh, so it doesn't do any runtime thing. But when my Py look at it, it's going to fail if you ask a type, it's not the right type. So it's very nice that now we can test our type uh, very easily using typing uh, built in. And finally, you can also subclass typing of any. So if you want, like instead of, of trying to type stuff, sometimes you just want this class and be anything, and I want to like, type any method or stuff like that. So just a class uh, typing that any. So when you create this uh, this class, you can add the same as any. Uh, also, the lib uh, two to three and the, the two to three tool is now deprecated and uh, eventually won't be able to work in uh, on the new Python. Uh, so if you're still on Python two, it might be a good time to think about moving forward. Otherwise, it's going to be just get harder and harder. Uh, and all that while being faster. So like uh, that's a lot of new feature, and this new feature actually faster than before. So Python is an average 25% faster than Python 3.10. And the nice thing Israel. is that you... Pardon mon interruption. Je sais pas ce qui s'est passé, mais la statique est revenue. <laughs> okay, uh, can you hear me? Oh, c'est bon ça. Okay, I'm just going to use my laptop microphone. It's going to be better. Perfect. Merci. So, yeah, as I was saying, so Python 3.11 is 25% faster than Python 3.10 in average in the benchmark of CPython. Uh, you don't have to change anything. It's like these are all improvements in like core Python. So, like, there's no such thing. Oh, yeah, it's much faster if you use like this specific pattern. No, like, whatever code you use is going to be faster. Um, like, just the, the startup time is 10 to 15% faster. And like the startup is not even code that you write, so like whatever tool you have, it's going to be faster. Um, so yeah, just a quick note: like the, during the migration to Python 3.11, like, we did it on our code base, which we have quite a lot of Python. A uh, bunch of like the, the little friction that we hit is uh, the dependency. So, like any Python version, pretty much if you are still using old dependencies, you you reach a point where these old dependencies uh, they don't build like the real package for your new version. So like let's say you use gRPC IO. <clears throat> if you use old gRPC IO version, you're gonna end up compiling the old like protobuf libraries and things like that, which is very annoying, first of all. You're gonna have failure, compil compiler is gonna fail. Uh, so like just use the wheel package, it's gonna save you a lot of time and a lot of pain. Uh, so the first thing is like upgrading your dependencies is gonna make things much easier because then you're gonna have access to all these wheel package. Uh, and also like sometimes like for the data class errors, like one of the, the only error actually I saw while migrating and that I found my dependencies, that now that class is gonna check uh, when you have a default, like right now if you try to do a data class with a default, like an empty dictionary, it's gonna give you an error. It's gonna tell you like you can't default to a mutable value. It's gonna bring you pain later on. So you have to use like the default factory, uh, but now it does that for any type, not just dictionary or list or things like that. Uh, so anywhere where you add like a default they call my custom class that used to work now it's going to raise you an error and some of your dependencies might have this pattern that raise you an error so you have to fork dependencies or you just have to update them and so yeah other than that the migration was pretty smooth uh, we have a lot of that uh, and only like one of them at uh, data class issue that we fixed um, and yeah i'm pretty much done a bunch of content uh, looking forward to python tweet tweet uh, 3, 12, 12, sorry, I'm tired. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so the nice thing with the next Python release is that uh, we're gonna have the same unpack syntax for the, but for the CoWRGs. 
Uh, so now we will be able to use a type dig to type your code WRD, uh, which is pretty neat. Like before, it will be only able to type with the dig. So like all my keys are going to be string or all my keys are going to be anything, which is not that useful. Now you're going to be able to like, my code WRD has a name and a year, and they're going to be type string and int. Um, also, there's going to be the override decorator, so you can like explicitly say like this method is overriding a method from the parent. So if you do a typo, or if you forgot to like put a method in your parent, it's going to give you an error. It's going to tell you like, hey, you know, like Baz is not in your parent. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you. Question for. <laughs> yep. Um, not particularly. Yeah, there, like there's a, a few CPI breakage or anything like that, but um, like for the most popular dependencies, they, they follow most of the time like the Python release. So like PyTorch is working on 311, should be working uh, Django as well. Like, uh, if you have smaller dependencies, as I said, like the data class is the one that hit me the most. Uh, people just use data class with default that should not be default. Uh, it used to work, doesn't work anymore. But yeah, other than that, like there's not so much change of behavior. Like things get deprecated or like those new things, but they don't change semantic. Thank you. Yep. If you run your script with uh, the module, you still get the squiggly line um good question uh, so just uh, we repeat for people online so if i run the pdb uh, module on my code like, am i gonna have the squiggly line uh, i would expect so since like uh, i would expect pdb to use the built-in uh, print trace back thing uh, i doubt that like, pdb is pretty much relying on built-ins like the squiggly line is like part of the print trace back uh, trace back module so it's like core to python now uh, the increase of speed of uh, the increase of the version 3.11. Uh, do you see this with like all the libraries, or do you need to use a core python library to see the, the difference in speed? Yeah. So, so the question is, uh, like the, the increase in speed, does it only apply like the core python, or only like third-party yeah. libraries? Yeah, everything, or just yeah. Uh, it's um, specific python. Yeah. So actually, if you look at the change log of Python, they have like a most often the change log is how they got the speed increase, and I have a, a look at it, and like most of the increase are really like core to the VM of Python. So whatever code you're running is going to be faster. So it can be like PyTorch, it can be um, this other like parsing library, and they're going to be just faster because the way Python uh, compiled the code, executed, like this comprehension are faster, the frame management is faster. So like just any Python code is going to be faster, uh, whether it's like the built-ins module or the third party. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, if you guys have any else uh, question, uh, is fine. Yeah. Uh, we'll be here. Yeah. So, okay, cool. Uh, so, do we need uh, a break for toilet or take another beer or I don't know? <laughs> or we can continue? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. We we continue. So if you guys want to, okay. Uh, so um, um we just said no end to it. No, sorry. <laughs> okay, but it. Oh, we are back to talk about how many people. How many? Is it you? You hear me always, Yannick? I hope so. Ça roule super bien sur le stream. Le son est top notch depuis qu'on a changé la configuration de micro. Merci. OK, cool, OK. Mais c'est ça, c'est que, ben, c'est ça, comme tu dis, il y a toujours la bière là, si, si vous avez soif, vous pouvez toujours continuer. Euh, aussi, j'ai oublié, on a notre photographe, fait que si vous pouvez faire des beaux souris là, comme ça, on va mettre sur notre site pour promouvoir un peu. Hein, notre... Bon, je vous laisse avec euh, Romain. Merci. On attend samedi. Tout le monde sera installé. Bon. Oui, c'est bon. Très bien. Est-ce que tu vois ici? Oui, c'est bon.
Ouais, et là, du... je pense que j'imagine que c'est du DSA comme ça. Non, c'est pas qui. Ok. Oups. Ah, c'est vrai, j'ai cru qu'il est là. Ok. Ah ouais, ouais, là il est Ça suffira comme ça. Ouais, c'est bon. Ok. Super. <rire> euh, bah, bonsoir à tous, merci d'être venus. Euh, je m'appelle Romain et je vais faire ma première présentation de Python Montréal et puis ma première présentation tout court en public. Euh, ce soir, je vais vous parler du double fork et du lancement de processus de longue durée en Python, plus particulièrement en web avec, euh, avec Django. Euh, donc pour représenter, euh, je suis développeur logiciel chez FGNR. Euh, ça fait un an que je travaille euh, chez eux. Euh, avant ça, j'étais à Bruxelles. Euh, je suis ingénieur en, de formation en France, mais ici, je n'ai pas le statut d'ingénieur, donc je n'ai pas le droit de le dire. Euh, J'aime le surf et les sports de montagne, donc c'est tout naturellement que j'ai choisi Montréal pour, pour venir habiter. Et, euh, et puis voilà. Donc je vais d'abord vous présenter les problématiques. Euh, Qu'est-ce qui amène à penser qu'on a besoin d'un processus de longue durée euh, On va voir ensuite les tâches asynchrones. Euh, un petit rappel en unique sur les threads, process, process group et sessions. Ensuite on verra le principe du double fork et en vain on verra les les exemples en théorie et en pratique. Donc si on prend euh, l'exemple d'un site euh, internet, si vous avez un site relativement classique, euh, site vitrine, vous n'avez pas besoin d'énormément de, de ressources. Mais si vous ajoutez des, des fonctionnalités un peu plus techniques, donc par exemple faire des exports, euh, envoyer des emails de, de registration ou autre, faire de la synchronisation de données ou encore euh, nettoyer votre database de temps en temps, vous allez avoir besoin euh, de processus. Euh, la limite conventionnelle, c'est de 30 secondes en web pour avoir des réponses, mais en termes de user experience, on aimerait bien que le temps de réponse soit assez court. Quand je clique sur un bouton d'export, je ne veux pas attendre 30 secondes que le bouton tourne et qu'on charge. Euh, J'aimerais avoir une réponse assez rapide. Donc C'est pour ces raisons qu'on a besoin de process qui tournent, euh, si possible, euh, seuls en arrière-plan, qui font leur, euh, leur job qui partagent les ressources, puisque si un utilisateur fait un export qui demande beaucoup de, de ressources, je veux que les autres utilisateurs puissent continuer à aller, euh, aller visiter les pages, que le même utilisateur puisse aller voir euh, je sais pas, un dashboard, par exemple. On veut pouvoir arrêter et redémarrer au besoin euh, ce processus, et on veut qu'il ait accès aux ressources euh, comme le code, mais aussi la, la database, peut-être les médias, les images euh, de notre site. Donc Par exemple, si je suis un utilisateur et que je demande un export à mon site, on peut faire une réponse directement en lui disant « Ok, l'export est en cours. Euh, » Et derrière, lancer une tâche euh, asynchrone qui va faire l'export et qui lui enverra le résultat euh, quand euh, l'export sera prêt. Pour ça, il existe déjà des solutions comme Celery en, en Python qui fonctionnent sur des tâches euh, soit ponctuelles, soit des tâches qui sont euh, prédéfinies. Donc, Par exemple, lancer tous les jours à minuit euh, une tâche particulière. Euh, le souci, c'est que Qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire pour des tâches qui sont plutôt en continu Donc, Typiquement, faire de la euh, mise à jour de données en continu par rapport à, à, un, à un système tiers. Donc, Si je demande de synchroniser euh, sur mon site les données, je ne vais pas demander à l'utilisateur d'appuyer toutes les 5 minutes sur un bouton pour qu'il synchronise les données. Ça ne va pas trop lui plaire et je ne vais pas non plus payer quelqu'un pour le faire. Donc, Les problèmes qu'on a ici, c'est qu'on a une action continue euh, qui va euh, accaparer les ressources. Parce que si on lance une tâche Celery qui, qui passe son temps à faire le, les demandes de, de, de données, elle va euh, empêcher les autres processus Celery, les autres tâches, de, de bien s'exécuter. Ce qui va augmenter du coup le, le prix aussi des, de nos serveurs, puisqu'on va devoir plus de workers ou d'agents Celery. Donc ce sont les, les petits serveurs de, de Celery qui exécutent les tâches. Euh, au plus on a de tâches, au plus on va en avoir besoin, et donc au plus ça va, ça va être difficile de scaler. Et aussi, il y a une notion de priorité, c'est-à-dire que si j'ai une tâche qui tourne en continu, comment je sais qui a la priorité sur euh, une nouvelle tâche qui va se Est-ce que je dois finir la tâche qui est avant, mais qui est en continu, donc qui ne va jamais lâcher la priorité, ou est-ce que euh, c'est -ce est à chaque fois la nouvelle tâche qui va prendre la priorité Donc là, 
euh, Celery là-dessus est limité, donc par son nombre d'agents, par la gestion de priorité de ressources et donc pas adapté aux tâches continues. Et c'est là que euh, rentre en jeu le double fork ou les démons en, en, en Python qui vont en fait fonctionner en parallèle euh, du code et vont euh, s'exécuter euh, de leur côté avec leurs ressources. Alors, avant de rentrer dans les détails euh, des, des, de comment on fait le double fork, je voulais vous faire un petit rappel euh, en Unix. Euh, c'est autant un rappel pour vous que pour moi, puisque ce n'est pas mon domaine de prédilection. <rire> Donc, euh, j'ai fait mes recherches pour mieux comprendre. Euh, en Unix, on utilise des sessions. Donc, il peut y avoir plusieurs sessions, mais il y en aura toujours une qui sera prioritaire sur les autres, qui sera en, en avant. Ces sessions gèrent des groupes de process, qui sont composés de process, et ces process euh, peuvent être composés de threads. Euh, les sessions sont contrôlées avec un terminal, ou du TTY, je ne sais pas comment on dit. Et euh, toutes ces, tous ces objets sont identifiés par leurs ID. Euh, le groupe de process qui est en tête, en gestion de la session, est appelé le, pro, le groupe leader. Et chaque groupe de process a un process qui est euh, prioritaire, qui est premier, et qui est aussi le leader. Ce qui fait qu'on a plusieurs leaders en process, mais il n'y a qu'un seul process qui va leader la session, c'est le process leader du groupe leader. Et seul euh, le session leader, donc le premier process du premier groupe, peut contrôler euh, le terminal de la session. Le principe du double fork, c'est en fait de créer un démon. Donc c'est un process qui va rouler en arrière-plan. Et ce qui fait la particularité de de ce process, c'est que son, son parent, donc le process dont il hérite, euh, est terminé et ce démon n'a pas, euh, pas de terminal. Il n'a pas le droit de contrôler un terminal par mesure de sécurité. Euh, comment on fait pour créer euh, un démon Donc On utilise le process de, de démonisation. On utilise le double fork qui nécessite en plus, euh, ce qui n'est pas indiqué dans ce nom-là, de découpler euh, la session, c'est-à-dire qu'il faut changer euh, le process de session pour être sûr qu'il n'appartient pas à la session qui, est, euh, qui gère le, la session principale. Donc, l'exemple de code euh, qui, est très, qui est disponible sur Internet, c'est le, vraiment le, la, la version euh, minimale du process, euh, consiste en trois étapes. Donc la première, c'est de faire un premier fork pour s'assurer que votre process ne sera pas le leader de, de sa session. Ensuite, euh, ce qu'on voit, les trois lignes, euh, cette seed, c'est pour euh, découpler, donc créer une nouvelle session, pour s'assurer que le process ne sera pas euh, dans la session euh, leader. Le unmask, c'est juste pour euh, permettre à votre process de pouvoir accéder euh, aux données, faire de l'écriture et de la lecture. Et on refait un fork pour s'assurer que le process qu'on qu a créé ne soit pas non plus le leader de la session qu'on vient de créer. Comme ça, on est sûr qu'il ne prendra jamais le contrôle de n'importe quelle session. En exemple, euh, avec des chiffres, ici par exemple, on a euh, notre session actuelle, la session 46, avec le groupe de process 84 et le process 84, qui est le leader de son groupe. Après le premier fork, on va voir notre process 85. Donc c'est la ligne 2. On va ensuite découpler, ce qui va permettre de ne plus être dans la session qui dirige l'OS. Le, le, et dernière étape, on fait un dernier fork, comme ça on est sûr et certain que si jamais, pour X raisons, il se passe des choses dont on n'a pas conscience, le process ne pourra jamais récupérer la session puisqu'il n'est plus le leader de la session. En pratique, euh, donc ça c'est le démon que nous on a mis en place euh, dans notre code. On voit qu'il y a bien la fonction ici que je vous ai montré juste avant. Et nous on a rajouté euh, quelques fonctions pour permettre de s'assurer que le démon est unique. Donc on a le start et le stop. En fait ce qu'on fait c'est que quand on lance le process, on vient écrire son ID dans un fichier. Et quand on vient euh, le démarrer, on regarde si l'ID existe. S'il existe, c'est qu'on a déjà un démon qui run, qui, qui tourne, et donc on interdit la création, on met un message d'erreur. Et pareil pour l'arrêt, quand on veut l'arrêter, s'il n'existe pas, on met un message d'erreur comme quoi le process n'existe pas. 
Et comme ça, on s'assure qu'on n'a qu'un seul process qui tourne pour ce, la tâche qu'on a envie d'exécuter. Euh, en exemple ici, euh, l'exemple qu'on a ici, c'est une classe abstraite, c'est-à-dire qu'il faut l'implémenter pour pouvoir euh, derrière faire le, les, les différentes utilisations qu'on veut. Et donc cette classe-là, c'est une implémentation que nous, on utilise actuellement, qui s'appelle Sinker, puisqu'en fait, l'objectif de ce démon-là, c'est de tourner euh, en continu et de synchroniser des données avec un système d'IRT. Donc on a notre code qui roule, on, peut faire, on a notre site qui fait, permet de faire des exports, des envois d'emails, etc. Et en parallèle, on a ce démon qui tourne tout seul de son côté et qui va sans arrêt euh, questionner un site tierce pour récupérer des données et mettre à jour notre base de données. On a simplement la fonction run ici à, à préciser, parce que si vous voyez ici tout en bas, euh, elle est à... Il faut l'override pour, euh, pour créer son, son démon. Et en dessous, vous mettez les fonctions qui euh, correspondent à votre logique métier pour euh, faire fonctionner votre démon. Euh, J'aurais voulu bien vous faire un, un exemple, mais comme il y a des données clients, je, je me contenterai des captures d'écran. Euh, donc, on est sous Django. Donc, on doit utiliser les fonctions Django pour, euh, pour lancer notre démon. Donc là, on est sur le serveur euh, du projet. On fait un simple start en précisant euh, la fonction Django qui va lancer le démon. On a ici un fichier de log dans lequel on log euh, ce qui se passe avec le démon pour pouvoir euh, s'assurer que tout fonctionne bien. Donc on voit que ça tourne tout seul. Et après, pour l'arrêter, il suffit de faire un simple stop des, des fonctions qu'on a vues juste avant. Euh, actuellement, nous, on utilise euh, deux démons. Un qui permet de, de récupérer des données en continu et en temps réel. On a un autre qui fait du calcul de cache, c'est-à-dire qu'il va, pour les pages les plus visitées et les requêtes les plus faites, euh, il va euh, alimenter une base de données euh, qui permet en fait d'aller charger les pages plus vite. Et pour le moment, on gère tout ça en ligne de commande sur le serveur. Les pistes d'amélioration et ce qu'il y a à prendre en compte euh, pour le, gérer les, les démons, c'est. Premièrement, on peut proposer une gestion directement en ligne, puisque comme c'est du Python, on peut tout à fait créer des, une page web pour les techniciens qui pourraient seulement eux pour y avoir accès, pour gérer le démarrage et l'arrêt et la gestion du, du démon. Et comme c'est un process euh, qui tourne en continu, on veut à tout prix être au courant des erreurs euh, et des blocages qu'il peut y avoir sur le, le bon déroulement du, du process. Euh, donc nous, par exemple, ce qu'on a en place actuellement, c'est un système d'email. On a de la détection d'erreurs qui nous envoie des emails pour dire euh, « attention, il y a une erreur » ou « attention, là, il y a quelque chose qui ne se passe pas comme ça de vrai euh, ». Mais il euh, y a encore plus, plusieurs pistes d'amélioration. Et, et euh, vous pouvez bien évidemment écrire, écrire la suite de ce que vous, vous pensez euh, pouvoir ajouter. Euh, pour les sources, si jamais euh, vous êtes intéressé, il y a euh, beaucoup d'exemples, de, et notamment euh, le premier que je vous ai montré, qui est vraiment la base du démon, qui est très facilement euh, réutilisable pour, pour les besoins de, 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 de vos applications. Et, euh, et ben c'est tout. On, a, on applaudit Romain, euh, c'est sa première présentation, tout le monde. <rire> Est-ce qu'on a des questions pour euh, Romain euh, Je regarde aussi sur euh, euh, online, j'ai complètement oublié qu'on a, on a lu euh, tout. Fait que, Yannick, aussi. tu gères euh, Est-ce que tu vois des questions sur. Euh, je ne vois pas de questions pour l'instant, mais je garde un, un coup d'œil sur euh, tous les endroits où on reçoit des questions, donc les commentaires sur YouTube et sur Slack, et puis je vais les relayer de vive voix si on en a. Cool, merci. OK. Euh... Quand... Mais moi, j'ai une question. Euh, je dis, est-ce que ça, ça, ça vaut la peine de... de, de d'écrire tout ça là comme en code tout ça, parce que j'ai l'impression que vous j'avoue que j'ai pas suivi toutes vos affaires mais 
est-ce que ça donne le résultat que vous voulez vraiment là, puis, puis, euh, qui règle vraiment votre problème J'imagine que oui. oui. Oui, puisque en fait, si on utilisait Celery pour faire euh, nos tâches, le problème, c'est que comme on fait de la synchronisation en temps réel, on ne sait jamais si la tâche est terminée euh, pour lancer une suivante, en fait. On ne sait jamais s'il y a une erreur. Alors qu'avec le, le démon, en fait, on, on a vraiment tout qui se fait euh, d'une seule traite et on arrive à catch euh, le moindre souci. Euh, et donc on n'a pas de blocage et pour l'allocation des ressources c'est beaucoup plus simple aussi parce que euh, le, le démon gère tout de son côté. Ah ok, cool. Ouais. Parce que c'est facile de faire voler sur un autre, sur un autre serveur des, de la synchronisation. Tout à fait. Euh, nous sur notre projet on a deux serveurs. On a le serveur de synchronisation qui fait rouler les démons et les tâches et le serveur de classique, on va dire, qui se, permet, enfin, qui se contente d'afficher les pages, de renvoyer les données au front-end. Et c'est géré par le serveur principal, c'est ça, le serveur Non, en fait, on a deux serveurs différents, et le serveur de sync n'est pas accessible par le front-end. Okay. Donc, pourquoi, pourquoi euh, C'est une bonne question. Euh, je pense qu'on pourrait faire les deux, euh, les deux sur le même serveur. Euh, on n'a pas encore fait vraiment d'études si euh, on avait un grand gain de, de temps. Mais avec un serveur assez puissant, on pourrait faire tourner les deux sans problème. Enfin, le, le front-end, l'échange avec le front et euh, les tâches chez et le, le démon. Ouais. Qu'est-ce qui se passe si le démon est euh, non, pour le moment, nous, on le remet manuellement. Euh, Romain, euh, Romain, je m'excuse de, 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 de l'interruption. Pour le bénéfice des gens qui suivent sur, sur YouTube, pourrais-tu répéter les questions? Juste la dernière, ah oui, pour l'instant. Euh, donc, la question, c'est qu'est-ce qui se passe si le démon crash? Est-ce qu'il se relance tout seul? Euh, pour le moment, non. Euh, le système que j'ai mis en place, c'est que s'il si y a un fichier qui existe avec l'ID, euh, ça veut dire que le sync est censé tourner. Et ce que je fais, c'est que je check s'il y a eu des tâches dans les 30 dernières minutes. S'il n'y en a pas eu, j'envoie un mail qui dit le sync est censé tourner, mais ça fait 30 minutes qu'il ne se passe rien. Il euh, faudrait quand même aller voir ce qui se passe. Donc, pour le moment, ça envoie un mail. Et euh, moi, je vais manuellement voir ce qui se passe. Et si vraiment il y a un problème, je restart, euh, je, je l'éteins et je le relance. Oui Pour euh, avoir une mise à jour euh, continue Pardon Pour avoir une mise à jour continue Oui, c'est ça. Et la solution, ce serait bah, Une des oui, solutions. Pour des rotations continuelles, sans interruption, en fait. Pour cela, servir en euh, résolution euh... euh, C'est possible, ce n'est pas une piste que. Alors, pour la question. Euh... <rire> J'ai un peu du mal. À... Si j'ai bien compris, ce serait d'utiliser des containers pour oui. lancer euh, sur, à plusieurs, dans plusieurs containers, lancer la tâche et récupérer celle du container qui réussit. C'est ça. Et s'il y a un échec, si ça échoue, en fait, on peut le jeter. En fait, euh, ce qui va rester, en fait, va continuer à rouler. Si c'est mon impression, en fait, ça peut être assez Alors, un peu naïf. Mais, hein. Je n'ai pas assez peu de connaissances dans les systèmes Minix pour savoir euh, si c'est possible, mais je me demande si ça prendrait pas trop de ressources pour euh, parce que ça, ça serait assez exponentiel comme euh, solution. 
Ça voudrait dire qu'on devrait créer plusieurs containers et qu'il y en aurait beaucoup qui serviraient entre guillemets à rien. Ouais. Donc c'est peut-être peut dangereux, mais je n'ai pas la réponse. Je pense que Mais sinon, de toute façon, toi tu restes avec nous. Ah bah oui, bah oui il y a beaucoup de monde. <rire> C'est bon, mais euh, bah, je vais juste conclure ça. Euh, Yannick, tu es toujours là ou... J'y suis, oui. Oui. <laughs> we, we still have some beer, right? <laughs> ouais, c'est ça, c'est terminé, ouais. Je, je conclue ça, ouais. Ok, ben bah, c'est ça. Euh, bah, merci tout le monde euh, bah, dans, dans, pour place et online. Je ne sais pas regarder combien de personnes qu'on a online, mais euh, c'était super cool. Est-ce que tu veux venir, euh, Yannick, juste pour voir si je n'ai pas oublié quelque chose, mais je ne pense pas que... Ah, on a perdu Yannick ici. Ben non, je suis encore là. Non, ok, non, ouais, ok. Ah oui, j'avoue que... Euh, J'avoue que... que Est-ce qu'on peut... Euh, ouais, mettre euh, Yannick en live pour que les gens le voient parce qu'il y a... Il y a assez... Bon Oui, non, non, mettre, tu, peux, tu peux mettre... Ah, il ouais, est là. Ok, c'est cool. Ok, cool. <rire> Yannick, c'est bon. <rire> ah oui. Ben, ben. Bonne soirée tout le monde. Euh, je suis vraiment content qu'on se rencontre en personne. Encore une fois, même si moi je suis pas en personne, euh, c'est toujours bon. Vous allez de là. Attends, attends, Yannick, on, on, on a perdu. Attends, Et puis, attends. ben, je vous invite euh, à, 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 à vous aussi. Et puis, les gens qui sont en ligne, il euh, n'y en a pas beaucoup en ligne parce qu'on a eu un petit changement d'URL. On va quand même peux... démarrer le 5 à 7 virtuel. Depuis que tu parlé, ça a coupé. Ah! Non? Tu veux plus rien dire? Oui. Ah, mais t'as pas... On est reparti, là? Est-ce que vous pouvez l'entendre? Ah, il y a de l'écho, c'est oh, dégueulasse. Oui, oui. En tout cas... Ce que je voulais dire, c'est bienvenue à Montréal Python en personne. Et puis moi, je prends une bière en pensant à vous. Et puis prenez-en une en pensant au Python. Peut-être à moi. Bon, c'est pas grave. C'est bon. Nous aussi, on va aller prendre des bières euh, ici. Puis on a la pizza qui s'en vient. Fait qu'on te laisse. <rire> Bonne soirée. Bonne soirée tout le monde. Ouais. Donc. On vient de perdre euh, nos amis qui sont, qui sont en maintenant en 5 à 7 physique. Et euh, je vois qu'on n'a pas énormément de personnes euh, qui sont sur le live stream. On s'excuse du changement d'URL. Je sais que ça, ça peut euh, induire à la confusion, mais je vais vous pester euh, tout de suite un lien. Si je suis capable de copier ça, il faut que je démasque un petit instant. Je vais pester dans les commentaires YouTube un lien vers où on va avoir le 5 à 7 virtuel. Et... Euh, J'enregistre ça, un petit instant, j'affiche, commentaire. Et zoop. Donc, je vous rejoins à cette URL dans un instant pour le 5 à 7 virtuel. Arrivez avec euh, votre rafraîchissement favori et, et nous n'aurons pas autant d'amusement que nos amis sur place.
Mais on s'amuse quand même. À tout de suite.